OK. All right, welcome back. Um, my name is Michael. I work on V8, Blink, um, bindings layer, oil pan, so pretty much anything related to cross-cutting memory management across our JavaScript and rendering pipeline. So usually my work should be kind of in the background, and you should not see any CLs from me. If every now and then still a CL pops up where my name is on it, this usually means that I'm trying to clean up something, some inconsistency. And since my renderer foo is not as good as my memory foo, you, you should usually help me out. So why am I here? What am I doing? I will try, or I was asked to give an update on Blink and V8 memory management. And while actually preparing for his talk, I soon realized that, oh boy, I'm missing out on a lot of terminology, on a lot of things. So, Instead of just presenting these seemingly not connected low-level details, um, I just thought I will throw the whole problem space at you, and we'll have a look at, on a high level at what, what's going to happen and what already happened. So memory management across Blink and V8. Um, this involves bindings. Bindings do a lot of things. They make sure that our calling conventions are consistent, they automatically generate code, but they also deal with memory management. And that means that they also deal with the way um, how V8 and Blink uh, is connected with respect to memory management. So whenever we have JavaScript and the DOM and anything, any mutation is going on there, the bindings are related. So here we have a document. We have a property access and document, and we have an add event listener call. What this usually means is that V8 and Blink are both involved. And they both have separate heaps. V8 has its own heap for JavaScript objects, and Blink has its heap for DOM objects. This usually means that we have a representation in each of those worlds. We have a document, actually, for these kind of purposes in V8's heap. All the property accesses, all the elements accesses, any JavaScript-related stuff, so the .a thing, it would go to that um, half. The other half is actually in the DOM. It's a DOM representation of the document. So any time you, for example, do any DOM mutation or you call it event listener or do things like that, would go to the DOM half. So, and, well, obviously they are, they are referencing each other because in order to actually call from JavaScript into the DOM, you need this reference and vice versa. So, and these things together is usually what, what form the document when, what you access from JavaScript. It's the wrapper, what we call on the V8 side, and the wrappable on the, the Blink side. This is very, like, this is on a very high level, the basic concept, um, how bindings connect V8, V8 and Blink. I will now try to give an example that's a bit more complete, not just accessing a document. It would be easy, right? So something where client and server-side rendering is involved. And I'm trying to only build up state relevant to V8 and Blink here that we really need for this example. It's a lot more complicated than what I'm presenting here, but I think it should convey the message. So in essence, what I'm trying to do is go through this example and show you how V8 and Blink sort of build up their heaps and what the end result is, right? So we have an example here that um, we have server-side render stuff, which is the body and the span here. We have JavaScript, and the JavaScript just appends one more diff. So it should actually be a trivial thing, right? So we'll go through the document. We'll go through it line by line. And I'm assuming I have a parser that builds up the DOM on the way. I have a JavaScript compiler. And we just assume a very happy world and, and no additional surrounding state. So first thing is we actually get a document, right? And we get it. It's, it has some reference to a local frame where, where it's, um, it's actually rendering implementation is attached to. So the parser sees the document. We create a document on the Blink side. No JavaScript is involved here. We don't need to do anything. We have, we, we, we encounter a script, right? So um, it comes along, passes the script, uh, parses the script, and we assume that V8 just generates some sort of top-level code eagerly. There is lots of stuff involved in V8, but for the purpose of this example, we assume um, V8 just sees this thing and decides, oh, we should generate some sort of code. Doesn't matter whether it's bytecode or optimized code, it's just code. Oh, then we see we have a document accessor from JavaScript, which means that we need to create the wrapper on the V8 side. So we do that, or actually the bindings layer does it for us. We have a call, add event listener, 
and we have a string there, we have a closure there, so once we, we do this kind of call, um, we have a lot of stuff going on on the DOM side, we have a lot of stuff going on in JavaScript land, and we wire these things up. So we have to create a hash map, sort of, or actually the hash map is already there, but we have to create a closure that points to this code. Um, for the purpose of this example, we assume that the string lives on the blink side, doesn't really matter. Um, so we wire this whole thing up. Good, we are done with the script. Um, next thing is body element. No JavaScript involved, right? So just the body element DOM side. And we have a span. So now we are done with the first pass, right? So the document content loaded callback should actually fire. Let's do that. So we actually enter the closure. We create this new def element using the document create element accessor actually function there. So we create this wrapper and wrappable pair on, on uh, the V8 and Blink side. That's that. We access then document. We already have a document, so nothing happens here. Um, then there's this body accessor, same story again. And finally, we have this append child. And it's a very minimal example, but you can already see that there is quite some stuff going on. And you can, I think, already also see that there is, I mean, it's a hard boundary between V8 and Blink here, but on a semantic level, things are kind of, kind of, uh, th there is no hard boundary, right? Sometimes something happens in V8, sometimes something happens in Blink. This is also due to like different teams working on it, so the responsibilities shift and not everything is, is clearly defined where it should live, right? Um, so yeah, that's that, like complete example. I think we should take a first deep breath here. Actually, maybe not so deep breath, because all the things you see all these, these graphs here are actually JavaScript and DOM graphs. So that's kind of my side project, my hobby project, um, where I render these things and actually have a look at them visually. So, and this is something that happens in the real world. Um, it's a bit more complicated. And this is the kind of stuff we throw at a memory management system, at garbage collectors or at cycle collectors or at whatnot. It's kind of these enormous big graphs that we wanna like, figure out liveness. On. So, still, I mean, in the end, it's just two components. Where is the actual problem in all of this? For, the, for that, um, to, to explain that, we should just recall this very simple example of document, a um, blink document, like the both sides here. Um, fundamentally, those two components have different heaps and different managed systems, and conceptually, if you just would any reference from V8 to Blink, a root for Blink, which means that, that Blink cannot assume anything and just needs to hold alive any memory um, that is pointed to from the outside, and vice versa, if V8 just assumes that it doesn't know anything and just assumes that any point that it's incoming into V8 just holds the object alive, and we have a reference cycle. None of these objects, this is, is not referenced from anywhere else, but if we have that assumption that it should be a root, then we cannot collect anything. So that's not a good state to be in, and that's why lots of engineers actu have actually worked on, on ways to, to kind of break these cycles, right? So what they've come up with, and what's actually currently state of the art on tip of tree, is they've separated Blink and V8's views on these graphs. For Blink, we take the simple way currently any incoming reference, we just treat as root. So that sort of works in one direction, but obviously we cannot do the other direction the same way. So for V8's view, we only actually look at, or we actually look at the relevant transitive closure even across boundaries. Right now this involves wrapper tracing, which means that V8 has this nice way of tracing through Blink. But on a conceptual level, that's, that's not, nothing new, right? Even with the, the system we had before, which was object grouping, you had a very same thing. V8 essentially knew more than just V8's heap. It knew the object grouping heap, which is the relevant DOM parts. So that's how we do it today. And that's how we encounter this weird scheduling problem, where if you assume that BGC means Blink GC and um, VHGC, yeah, well, it's the regular VHGC, that sometimes when the garbage collector kicks in, we have non-effective garbage collections. You can, uh, because Blink cannot actually do much if there are incoming references, right? So you might have a Blink GC that's very effective, so all our heuristics work really well, 
then memory builds up again, and you do blink GCs, blink GCs, because some heuristic tells you to do so, but nothing actually happens because blink cannot do anything. Then, because people have thought about this problem, um, the HGC kicks in. Heuristics are very complicated. Um, that's actually one area of bugs, right? It's just a set of heuristics. There's nothing funda fundamental going on here. So we schedule a VHGC, and suddenly both GCs, if you schedule them in the right order back to back, they are super effective. And then for other reasons, we, we, you could, could reverse this thing, and the VHGC be, could become non-effective because there is DOM state that is hell alive somewhere else. So you actually need a blink GC. So it's, it's not just that you, you, you need V8 and blink GCs both, but sometimes you need it in the right order. So this is a really hard problem. And it turns out that heuristics is, is like using regular heuristics is not enough here. So we want to do something else. I want to quickly propose or have a look at something else by just recalling that example and proposing that in an alternative world, that would not actually be a problem. Suppose we just have one renderer heap. It's next to impossible to do that right now. But if you would have only one heap, let's go back, you wouldn't have these weird wrapper, wrappable distinctions, right? You would just have one object that's your document and you would have one body element and whatnot. And actually, Blink in JS try to go into this direction. I implement the DOM um, directly in JavaScript. Didn't work for other reasons, and there are very good reasons this didn't work. But just as a logical concept, in an ideal world, we would only have one heap and only one GC that kind of manages this live uh, memory. So we want to take this logical concept, one heap, and actually apply it to our current system. So this is the, the unify heap idea. is nothing more than a compromise. We realized we have a hard time in actually just providing one heap. Doesn't work. Like we, we cannot just move Blink to JavaScript. Didn't work for other reasons too. Um, and the other way also doesn't work, right? So we need we need a compromise here. And this is just simply we keep both heaps separate but we provide them with infrastructure and APIs and, and, and concepts where you can actually do a full garbage collection across this whole, both heaps together. Um, that means that we need to adjust oil pen a bit. That means that we need to adjust V8's garbage collector, which is called Orinoco a bit. Um, and then ultimately, this will yield in deprecating wrapper tracing because we can have one GC that kind of sees this whole world. In order to explain how this actually works and a bit more garbage collection stuff, we need to do a couple of interludes. So garbage collection. Um, when we talk about garbage collection, we usually distinguish on a very high level um, already between what, what kind of sort of uh, garbage collector we have here. We can have one that's just atomic. So everything is performed on the main thread in one chunk. That's actually how oil pen works these days, mostly. I will explain a bit more later. Um, then we can have an incremental garbage collector um, where certain operations are split up into steps and they interleave with actual application code, which is our main thread code. Could be JavaScript, could be rendering, could be something else. Usually, making something incremental means there is a, a slight regression of, 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 I don't know, arbitrary number, a few percent, um, in throughput because you need to maintain maintain a consistent state on your heap. You need to add extra infrastructure. You need to essentially do more stuff. So throughput uh, usually regresses a bit. And then there is a concurrent GC, a holy grail. Ideally, everything is concurrent, and you wouldn't see a thing. It's not that easy most of the time, where you actually can leverage background threads and do something on the main thread, ideally not too much, and then leverage essentially background threads to do the main chunk of the work. So. That's the general idea um, we have here. Um, the phases we actually need to go to continue our marking and sweeping. And I just quickly want to want to want to go through this so you have a rough idea, and then we can look at the unified heap idea again. So for marking, a garbage collector usually considers a root set, which are these initial edges into a graph that you want to keep alive. At any time when you want to kick in a garbage collection, these are usually global variables. Um, any local variables that are maybe on the stack or even in, or in registers, so you consider those. And then you start marking from those. You essentially, in an atomic marking, marking uh, garbage collector, you, you go from edge to edge and mark objects as black, which means it's live. 
And then once you figure that out, you can, can continue on. In an incremental world, you don't have, you not only have marked and unmarked, which is white, uh, black and white, but you also have this logically this intermediate state which helps you maintain a consistency condition, which is that um, no black, no marked objects should point to, to unmarked objects. So you have this intermediate step, which essentially tells you these are objects that are live, but they have not been fully processed. So essentially what happens is that you mark your root set as gray, which are unprocessed objects that are live. You then continue and go on um, in an incremental fashion, like you start marking, you start marking this object fully, and any object that's reachable, you mark gray. You can continue on. Actually, you don't need to continue on. You can just interleave it with application code, right? So when you, when you decide that you want to continue garbage collection, you continue. I will not go into details how this works with graph modifications because these are the consistency conditions like write-read barriers and, and things like that. Um, if you have questions about that, just hit me, hit, me up on the, uh, hit me up offline, but I don't think it's just relevant here. So we continue on marking, um, we process objects, and at some point we are fully done. At this point, marking is essentially finished, and for concurrent marking, the same thing would apply with the difference that application code does not interleave but can run concurrently. And then the sweeping phase kicks in, and the sweeping phase essentially just reclaims that object, which means it it has a, way, like a sweeper has a way to find memory that is dead and make that available to the allocator again. So these are the concepts that we need for, for, uh, for garbage collection, and then we can have a look at the unified heap. It's nothing more than what I just explained with the addition that we have infrastructure to hand, hand off responsibilities between V8 and Blink. Actually, in order to start garbage collection, we need a root somewhere. So we just assume that we have a V8 root to document. In, in the real world, this is more complicated. Um, usually, it involves contexts and V8 concepts that are whole alive from, from the, the renderer. But for this example, this should be enough. So we start actually off with V8. We fully process this object. We mark this other one gray. Um, we then can continue on. Like we process the blink side of the document, mark things that it can reach gray, that are the objects that need to be processed. We then see hash map. OK, we do the same thing. Or actually not, because hash map is a bit, actually not, it's not the hash map, but strings are a bit different. Strings don't live on the managed heap for most parts on the blink side, so we ignore that one. Um, we are still in blink land. We assume that. Currently, everything runs incremental. Um, we still process Blink objects, and now we hand over to V8, and V8 starts processing objects. In a world, in a future world, maybe one year from now, everything here happens concurrently with all the consistency conditions enabled, with all the infrastructure in place, and V8 and Blink can just mark concurrently uh, both of their heaps and hand off responsibilities or references to the other collector. Um, then in a unified heap, we can actually get rid of objects too. So it seems very intuitive. Where is the difficulty and where is actually the difference to, to, um, to the current system? Where is the repo tracing delta? There are a few deltas. Might not all be obvious here, but there are. So for example, proper stack handling uh, for repo tracing is only implemented in certain parts and it's very delicate and fragile. So we want to get rid of that and just replace it with oil pan stack handling, which is complete, right? Um, then we can, or on purpose, we didn't cover all code paths um, in oil pan's heap. We only covered those code paths that could lead to, to references on the V8 side, which means that we didn't fully mark oil pan's heap, which also means that we couldn't start sweeping on all pens heap. We only could process essentially um, V8 objects after doing a repo tracing garbage collection. So with the unified heap, we want to change that. We actually want to trace through the whole graph, which in this case would include this local frame, for example, because that's not part of the repo tracing world, but we would still mark it. And we could then sweep both heaps essentially. So with that being said, that's the fundamental problem we are we are having um, with lots and lots of details of kind of accumulated technical depth. So you cannot kind of design something completely from scratch, but you can fit your system in. Um, that being said, the current roadmap for all these things, if you look at the unified heap, we definitely don't want to regress any current garbage collection strategies. So anything 
essentially, the, the, the current throughput, latency, and memory requirements should not regress. We want to make memory better with the unified heap, but definitely not latency worse. So when looking at this complete picture, we have V8 and OilPens garbage collector, Orinoco, uh, V8's garbage collector called Orinoco. We have concurrent marking uh, recently shipped, I think, in M63. We have concurrent sweeping. We've had that for a long time. We have parallel compaction for over a year now, almost two years, I think. So that seems in OK shape. We usually have sub-millisecond pause times for the VHEC and then a few milliseconds for the atomic pause on latency critical paths. For oil pen, when we look at the picture, it's not yet as complete. We have still non-incremental marking. I will give an update on incremental marking just in a, in a few minutes. And we have incremental sweeping. We can live with incremental sweeping because we can hide that somewhere in, in idle time. Um, and it, it kind of spreads out over the execution timer, so that's fine. Um, we cannot live with non-incremental marking. We have optimized V8's garbage collector to be sub-millisecond, and we just cannot add up, in worst cases, like 20 milliseconds marking time just to do this unified garbage collection. So we need to do something there. And the plan here is actually involves multiple steps. So first, we definitely need to do incremental marking. Um, the second step, is oil pen concurrent marking, and I will get to that, and if we need that, and if we do that immediately um, um, on the next slide. And then we can do the unified heap. So oil pen incremental marking update. You should not see any changes in non-platform blink code. If you do see some, um, then this means that at some point, somebody decided to add a hex somewhere, and we are ripping that out now because we want a uniform architecture. Um, it's already implemented behind uh, GNARC, and the, we have a stress bot actually that essentially runs incremental marking all the time. Um, it's almost fully green on layout tests. I can actually already run um, incremental marking locally all the time in Chrome. We, we were a bit paranoid because um, doing incremental marking means that we are kind of have to maintain a consistency condition in our graphs. So uh, we thought about how can we ensure correctness there. We essentially wrote unit tests from scratch for all these uh, write barriers, which are enforcing the consistency of the graph. Um, we wrote an almost exhaustive, I would say, um, unit test suite for all WTF collections, like moving, copying, and whatnot, all these operations like m place, m -place back and things like that. So we covered that. We still thought, well, maybe something slips through somewhere because not all of the things are managed pointers, so we wrote a runtime verifier um, that essentially, after marking, checks that we don't have any references from marked to unmarked objects, and we already landed that um, for oil pens tip of tree. So we have a FYI bot currently that checks that, that's fine. Um, and we are currently in the stage where we want to do performance tuning and get it in a shape where we can land it. Now, concurrent marking. Um, again, ideally that should not yield in any changes in non-platform code, and might be needed if incremental marking um, is regressing throughput too much. So we might need to go the next step there just to make it fast enough um, so that we can get away with any throughput regressions. It is, however, based on incremental marking, so there is nothing fundamentally new that needs to be added. Um, the, the, the difficult thing here is the concurrent access and how we are essentially making T's unhappy and not, not uh, causing any inconsistent states. And we want to do that in a way similar to, to V8, where we've learned our lessons, oh, it was hard lessons, uh, where essentially we want to process any easy objects, any objects with just regular managed pointers, these member abstractions, we want to process them concurrently and kind of postpone any complex types like collections that kind of weird corner cases. We want to postpone uh, those things and do that on the main thread. So we don't run into trouble of kind of expanding some collection and concurrently collecting stuff there. It seems very tricky, and we just want to postpone that because we learned from V8 that actually dealing with the 90%, which is m like the, mostly the easy cases, is usually enough. So if incremental marking turns out to be regressing too much, we need to do concurrent marking next. And then, finally, we can do this unified heap thingy where we schedule one big garbage collection. We are already working on it. We are currently sanitizing a lot of stuff on the heap where we, in the past, took shortcuts just to, I don't know, get, into, get, it, get it faster on microbenchmarks. We are sanitizing that a bit now. And as an intermediate step, we are already thinking of merging the visitation 
um, which is actually visible in non uh, non heap non platform blink code. So you might recall things like like that, where you have a tracing method and you have a trace wrappers method, and they both look the very same because they both involve wrapper tracing. So the idea is to actually move that along uh, a bit faster and get rid of this part. And that's possible because we already generalized our, our visitation infrastructure, which also benefited debugging a lot. Um, we, we presented yesterday in the Lightning Talks that we can now um, um, have heap snapshots that show you a precise retaining path um, across the DOM parts that involve wrapper tracing. This was kind of pre-work that led to the possibility to remove move these things. And Having that said, I think the takeaways should be pretty simple here. Um, garbage collection across components, like V8 and Blink, is pretty tricky. You cannot have any cycles. You need to work your way around that. Uh, unified heap solves that in a principled way. Um, ideally, we would have only one render heap. We cannot do that, so we do unified heap. The full GCs can cover both heaps, and they allow separate sweeping, which is awesome. And incremental and concurrent marking are the the incremental steps on the way, so to say, before we can actually go there. So having said that, uh, happy to take questions and otherwise just uh, chat me up um, offline. We can answer your questions. Questions? Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> so sometimes there are roots that live only on the blink side. Like if you have an image element and you set an onload handler and then you kick it off with a setting the source attribute, then you drop the JavaScript reference on the floor, the only thing that's gonna keep it alive is the, you know, some post task or something on the C++ side. And there have totally been bugs where when we drop the JS reference, that image gets GC'd and then you don't get your onload handler ever called. Yes. How are we gonna solve this in a principled way in the unified heap to make sure that you know, those persistent references on the, on the oil pan side continue to work well? The, with the unified heap, that will not be a problem. The problem right now is that sometimes we, we don't kick GCs off in the right order. So, or, or sometimes, so for the, this image example, um, if, you, if you don't only do blink GCs, you wouldn't see anything happening. If you do a V8 GC followed by a blink GC, then memory gets collected. Um, that's the first, that's the scheduling problem. The second problem, references should never be dropped on the floor um, in, in uh, oil pen nor in, in V8, so that would be a bug. Right now we know of a few instances with wrapper tracing where things are not handled uh, properly on the stack, but with a unified heap approach we actually have proper stack handling on both, in both worlds and dropping references should just not happen. Did you think about getting rid of trace members? <laughs> so trace members, uh, you, do you mean like the regular member type, right? Regular member types, yeah. Okay, the regular member type is actually needed for incremental and concurrent garbage collection to maintain a consistency condition that we never point to, like never have references from marked to unmarked objects. So we will not get rid of those. Getting rid of those would mean that we actually need compiler support. Like, yes, that's, that's what I kind of... That's what you're hinting yeah. to, okay. So in a world where we only have Clang now, we could think of Clang plugins that maintain these references to these managed types, essentially, to these garbage collected types. That's how other systems do it. It was previously just not possible to do it because we had different compiler architectures. We could do it now. We would need to convince others that we should entirely drop GCC support, for example, like not even have a community support for that. Then we could go there. Um, I'm open for that, yeah, why not? Awesome. <laughs> Can I ask another question? Sure. <laughs> um, so as far as I understand, V8 is going to be responsible for all, all memory uh, collection, and right? Well, you could, in, I think in the first step, yes, because V8 has a pretty sophisticated growing strategy that also knows about oil pens heap size. So V8 will be, in a unified heap, V8 will probably be um, initially the driver for garbage collections. Um, I would not say that this is like a requirement. You could have some controller somewhere that kicks off these things. It's just, I think initially V8 is, um, fits best because it has the most sophisticated growing strategy right now. So 
my question would be, what do you do in unit tests when you need to instantiate, for example, native objects and you don't have garbage collection around? Uh, how would we collect them or like what we yeah, want to verify? How do, you, how do you instantiate native objects that are supposed to be collectible? Well, you can just instantiate them. Like you, you, in, in, you would always need, uh, like you would need either an environment where you, if you really want to have a unit test, you turn off the GC, but then your test cannot like collect anything. Otherwise, you have to live with a GC in the back. Like, I guess you, you don't want to have a GC, right? That's your problem, or? No, uh, it's, 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 okay, okay. If you want to call it, you can actually like call these things. For testing purpose, like we don't want to have these calls and we don't want anybody on, on user code like triggering garbage collections manually, for, but for testing purposes, we will obviously have calls where you can trigger those scenarios. And actually, that's how we implemented unit tests. Thank you. Okay. I guess that's it. Thank you.